I have the privilege of introducing to you Andrew West. Uh, Andrew West is an observational astrophysicist. He's assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy. His research focuses on M and L type dwarf stars, the smallest yet most numerous stars in the, Mil in the Milky Way. He's been using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to help assign ages to old stars by using measurements of their velocities. So the theory is that older stars will have uh, had more chance encounters with other stars, and because of these encounters, they're boosted to higher speeds. So Professor West uh, uh, has many interests uh, uh, related to and outside of science. Uh, he's deeply involved in efforts to increase the diversity of people in uh, the science professions. And when he's not attempting to solve these mysteries of the universe, uh, he can be found playing ultimate frisbee, cooking, and hiking. Andrew. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for having me. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. That's right. I, I see some Alien World alums in the, or current students. I see Emmy asked a question, who's in my class right now. Um, so uh, you can't read it. It says billions and billions of planets. So I have four goals for tonight. Four. One. I want you to learn that science does what, Alien Worlds people? Changes. changes, that's right, it changes. Science changes. Two, I want you to walk away and know that we now live in a world where we know that planets are common around other stars. If you learn nothing else tonight, you, you will learn that. Um, three, I want you to see that people are doing really exciting things at BU. And four, you're gonna learn how you might learn some more. So um, I start with, um, Star Wars, although I love the, the last talk and that talking about Star Trek because I remember watching that episode, um, which was probably in the early 90s, um, and it was uh, probably something that made me be standing here, the person I am today, watching Jean-Luc Picard play his flute and being highly influenced by that. Um, but that, just like this photo, this photo from the shoot at Star Wars, um, was an era where we knew of no other planets outside of the solar system. In fact, that really was science fiction. That was an era where we could have Star Trek, we could have Luke Skywalker sitting on the planet of Tatooine with its binary stars, and all the astronomers laughed, and they said, George Lucas, you're stupid. There's no possible way you can have a planet that forms around a binary star because they just can't, it's gravitationally unstable, silly George Lucas. Um, but this was science fiction because at that point, our vision of the solar system was literally this. We knew of the eight planets in our solar system. Well, at that point there were nine, but, <laughs> but now there's eight because Pluto has gone the way of the warrior and is a dwarf planet. Um, and that's a subject for a whole other day. Um, but now we live in a world where we know planets exist around other stars. Um, and we call those planets extrasolar planets, or we shorten that to exoplanets. And we not only know they exist, and we've known that since the mid-1990s, but we now know, just in the last year or so, that they exist in great abundance. And that's, again, one, remember one of the takeaways. Um, we really live in this golden age of exoplanet studies. This is just a graph of the number of exoplanets discovered on the vertical axis as a function of year. And this is actually only through 2013, but you can see it just is almost exponentially increasing. And in fact, this was only taken halfway through 2013. So the number just keeps going up and up. Um, in fact, uh, this is as of tonight, as I was sitting in Rich Hall or Sleeper Hall eating dinner, um, I downloaded the very newest uh, number of exoplanets. We know of 1,822 confirmed planets around other stars. And I actually had to update this from what I showed in my class last week because science does what? Changes. It changes, that's right. So even since I did this last week, um, it's actually changed. That's right, you guys know. This is hot. I mean, this is like a really hot topic. This is where you get the cash in astronomy. This is where, um, you know, lots of excitement is. There's an iPhone app. You can all download it. It's fun. It's free. Um, it buzzes when a new exoplanet is discovered. Woo! It's exciting. Um, even today in the news. Um, oh, this is unfortunately the, the lights blocking the caption. Half of all exoplanets are around binaries. Oh, George Lucas. <laughs> So guess what? Science did what? 
It changed, that's right. So, you know, just today was announced that like most of the exoplanets are around binary. So George Lucas is vindicated. Like Tatooine can exist. Um, it can be around, and this is actually just literally I pulled off the news today. Um, but the, the really cool thing that's happened just last year is that um, we've you had these giant statistical data sets. So, so, what, much of what we learned about when we talked about the baseball earlier, we have these giant data sets, literally hundreds of millions of stars, and we've been able to see that a huge fraction of these stars have planets. It's at least 70% of all stars in our galaxy have at least one planet. Planets are crazy common, and there are hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way. Hundreds of billions, B, B, billion. You know, if you started counting, one, two, three, four, five, get to a billion, take me over 30 years to get to a billion. All right, so that's a huge number, and there are at least 100 billion stars, probably 200 billion stars in our galaxy. Each one probably has a planet or so, at least. So hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy alone, and we know of hundreds of billions of galaxies. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> it turns out most of these planets are actually common around small stars, much smaller than our own sun. You might say, well, that means stars come in different varieties. Yeah, our sun is just one of many types of stars. So this is what's called the HR diagram. It's one of the few diagrams you're going to get tonight. Um, it's really important. It's probably the most important diagram in all of stellar astronomy and arguably astronomy. Um, it's literally the brightness on the vertical axis versus the temperature or color. Those things are related. Things that are really, really hot, which is on the left-hand side, are blue. Things that are kind of cool are on the red. It tells you that whoever did the faucet handles was an idiot. Um, <laughs> Right, so like they didn't know anything about physics. The blue should be hot. It's a hot, it's a higher energy wavelength. Um, come on, right? Uh, <laughs> no, they were probably thinking fire and ice or something like that. But but really, blue is hot. You know, you know if you held a match or a burner, the hottest parts, the blue part, the coolest parts, the red part. Same with stars. You look up at the night sky, you see a bluish star. It's a hot. A redder star is going to be cool. And what's really neat is when you plot stars, their brightness versus their color, they fall in these really nice sequences. In fact, there's this really nice sequence here, which is all stars that are living kind of their normal life. Um, and again, we could spend a whole class talking about that. The sun lives right here, and so this type of star. And so there are stars here that are hotter, bigger, more massive, brighter. And there are stars down here that are smaller, cooler, um, less massive, and much dimmer. And you can actually see I like this plot um, because it actually shows that these ones are much less frequent. They're, they're much less numerous. These are actually about 70% are these types of stars. And you heard in my introduction that I study um, the certain letter of stars. I actually study things called M stars or L stars, which are even kind of a little bit to the right of this plot. There's this fun mnemonic up here. There's these letters that are the spectral classification of stars. They don't go in alphabetical order, so you have to remember a phrase. Um, your, most textbooks say something like, oh, uh, oh, be a fine girl or guy, kiss me. I hate that one. Um, <laughs> instead, I, I prefer only boring astronomers find gratification knowing mnemonics. Because <laughs> it's extra nerdy. You get, a, you get like the silent M. It's, it's good. It's, 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 it's super dork. I love it. Um, and so anyway, I study these guys down here, which are cool stars. They're tiny. They're not very luminous. They make up 70% of all the stars in the galaxy, and yet you can't see a single one with your naked eye. You look up at a clearest. You go to New Hampshire, Maine. Go to you know, Northern California, where I grew up. Beautiful night skies. You see thousands of stars. You don't see a single one of these because they're too dim. They're too intrinsically dim. You need telescopes to see them. Um, and yet they make up almost all of the stars. And as I said in the previous slide, most of the small planets are around these stars. So that's actually very nice that these tend to make small planets, and they're the most numerous types of stars. So if we want to look for small planets, they're everywhere. And that's something we've literally just learned in the last year or two. So exciting. So my research focuses on those stars. Um, I get to travel all over the world. Um, I teach, uh, the last few years I've taught a freshman year experience or FY 101 class, take them to Arizona. This is the Discovery Channel Telescope, which uh, Boston University has graciously bought into. Um, this is another telescope we use at Lowell Observatory. It's a 1.8 meter telescope. 
Um, blah, 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 Let's see if I can, there we go. There's me in front of the Discovery Channel telescope and here's two, me and two of my students down in Chile using another telescope, all studying um, these very small stars, a lot with the intention to classify them so we can understand how habitable their environments are to planets orbiting them and to actually understand the properties of the planets that orbit them themselves. And part of what's important is when we talk about the habitability, oops, woohoo, the habitability of planets. Um, we have stars of different types. We have stars that are more massive. This is the mass of the star. These are brighter, more massive, bigger stars. These are dimmer, cooler, smaller stars. These are putting off less light than the sun. These are putting out more light than the sun. This is a zone that astronomers call the habitable zone. It's the zone in which you could have liquid water on the surface of your planet. So, at the Earth, at, in our solar system, that's actually right where the Earth is, hey, conveniently. Um, we, are, we are not too far away where all the water would freeze and it would be cold, or you're not so close that all the water would boil away. We're kind of in that Goldilocks spot, it's just right. And so if you're around a cooler star, if you're around a cooler star, it's that, that zone is much closer. If you're around a hotter star, it's much farther. And so we need to characterize these stars in order to better understand the planetary environments. Now, how do we find these stars? I'm just going to give you the like crazy quick view. Um, it's really a needle in a haystack, right? You're looking at these very, very bright stars. Um, they have very dim planets orbiting them. I hate this expression, finding a needle in a haystack, because if you're really smart, you either burn that sucker down, and what you're, <laughs> and what you're left with is a needle, hey, right? Or you make an electromagnet, and you get the th thing, right? So if you're smart, there's no needle in a haystack. You just use your brain. Um, so. <laughs> So, so how do we do that? Um, we detect gravitational wobble of stars. Um, you probably all were lied to in middle school when you learned about the solar system and people said planets orbit the star. That's actually not what happens. They orbit this balance point between the star and the planet, and the star itself wobbles. Our sun is wobbling in response to planets. It does some crazy wobble because it's got lots of little planets around it, but um, you know, th this is one way we can do it. We can detect this wobble with really sensitive instruments. Again, whole day in my class. Um, we also can detect planets when they are perfectly aligned between us and their star, and they pass in front of their star, blocking a tiny amount of light. We call this the transit method. It blocks a tiny amount of light. We can watch a planet as it passes in front of that star. This has actually been the most successful method for detecting planets. In fact, oops, in fact, the, the most uh, successful mission has been the Kepler spacecraft mission, which actually stared at one point of the sky for so many years, and it just looked and looked. It was like the most boring astronomical observation of all time, but it waited as planets passed in front of their stars, and it could detect those planets to really high precision. In fact, it's now found more than 3,800 planet candidates, 90, over 90% 90 of which we think are real. So it, it takes that number of 1,800 and blows it away. Um, they're still being confirmed. Some of those have been Earth size. We're getting to the, the, the place where we're being able to detect Earth size, Earth mass planets. This planet was detected by my friend um, Andrew Howard, who's a professor at University of Hawaii. And this is actually a planet that's not only about the same size as the Earth and a little bit more massive, but it's actually made of, we think, rock and iron. It's a, it's a world you can step on. Now, unfortunately, it's colored red because it's really close to its star, and so it's probably molten and really crappy to live on. But we're getting to the place where we can just uh, find planets like that. Um, some of this is happening at BU. Um, this is actually a, a plot that I got from one of my colleagues, Professor Phil Muirhead, who actually just discovered uh, these five planets around two small stars. These are the systems. This is Jupiter and its four Galilean moons. This is another system that he discovered. Um, this actually hasn't been published yet, so um, we'll have to talk with the video people about <laughs> whether or not um, how this gets produced. But um, this is a brand new uh, you know, hot off the press research happening here at Boston University. Um, so I want you to think about, in my last couple minutes, I want you to think about how many planets are out there. This is the deepest image ever taken by humans. It's the, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Almost every single object you see in this image is a galaxy. That's a star, that's a star, but this little dot right there, that's a galaxy, that's 100 billion stars. That's 100 billion stars. That's 100 billion stars. That's 100 billion stars. If you took a ballpoint pen and held it at arm's length, 
This doesn't even cover the tip of the ballpoint pen. The universe is full of galaxies, it's full of stars, and it's likely full of planets. So next time you look up on a nice clear sky and you see thousands of stars in the sky, know that you're also looking at thousands and thousands of other worlds around other stars. Now if you want to know more, um, <laughs> I teach what's called, been called a crazy class at BU. Huffington Post named it uh, top 10 craziest classes in the United States for some weird reason, maybe because I grow a mustache once in a while, which is not a good look. Um, it's called a, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah, nice. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and like Andy, I also uh, have been fortunate enough to be one of the um, first people to do one of these um, massive open online classrooms, these MOOCs at BU on the edX platform. And we're currently finishing up um, the Alien Worlds MOOC, which is all about this information. It's something you can register for. It's something that you can take for free um, and be part of this experience to learn about these countless worlds we're discovering around other stars. Thank you very much. Why do you collect planets? Why do I collect planets? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, one of the, I mean, I think one of this, this question of both collecting the planets and then characterizing them is a fundamental one of humans. I mean, humans have been looking at the night sky for thousands of years, wondering if we're alone, wondering, um, you know, what's out there, who's out there. And literally, in the last year or two, we can say for the first time in human history that we know, at least in terms of the planets, we're not alone. Now, we don't know like if there's little civilizations like Catan sending out you know, these probes. Um, but we know for the first time in human history that planets are crazy common. And so I think that's the big question out here that, that really motivates a lot of the work that I do, is, is trying to explore um, kind of our place in the universe. Hey, how's it going? Uh, quick question. So earlier you showed a planet that was made of iron. Yeah. How is it that you would detect if there was water? Oh, so cool question. Um, so, um, one, so we are right at the technology. We just have the, the technology right now to detect um, atmospheres on these planets. And so there's been a few planets, a handful, where we've been able to detect um, elements in the atmosphere of these planets. And so one of the things that, that we could potentially do was detect water vapor in the um, atmosphere of one of these extrasolar planets. Um, and in fact, there's going to be a new um, NASA mission that's going to launch probably at the end of this decade called the James Webb Space Telescope. It's the, it's the next Hubble Space Telescope. And it has the capabilities to measure detailed atmospheric abundance on a number of these worlds, including water, but actually maybe more importantly, things like oxygen and methane, which would be awesome um, tracers of life. So that could happen in a decade. Cool, yeah. <laughs> Science does what? Change. There you go. Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, Maybe a little silly, but I've always wondered this. Um, so I know on Earth you need water and oxygen to live, but like, have you? Uh, do you think it's possible that other planets don't need that? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, life as we know it on on Earth requires really just water, um, some kind of uh, food source, or and then some energy source. Um, so a lot of what we're looking for in terms of life elsewhere is really relying on those ingredients. But it's, it's very possible that there's life elsewhere in the universe, maybe even in our own solar system, that doesn't rely on those ingredients. Now, much of what we concentrate our effort for is looking for things that have water, that would have an energy source, and have the kind of resources, the building blocks that you need to have life. And those are ubiquitous. I mean, we see. We actually see even amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. We actually see those floating in interstellar space. So those are ubiquitous in the galaxy. 
So all the pieces are there. We just need to find them all put together. There's a couple more. If you yell, I'll repeat. Oh, so the question is, are there any other worlds that have been discovered of these 1,800? Have any been discovered in the habitable zone? Yes, there's been a handful. About, about 10 have been discovered in the, in the habitable zone. Most of them are really giant, like Jupiter, um, which is a big ball of gas and not one you would want to sit on. But <laughs> Jupiter actually has a bunch of these moons around it that are actually pretty big size. They're terrestrial, means you could actually step on them. And so some of these worlds actually might have moons orbiting them that actually could be habitable. And we actually, at this point, have not found what would be called an exomoon. And that, we are right at the edge of kind of our technology being able to do that. That could happen in the next few years. I mean, it could happen tomorrow. Who knows? Uh, but um, we are right at the edge of being able to discover those types of objects around giant planets in the habitable zone. Cool question. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs>